Again, a very warm good morning on a not so warm day. We're glad that you've chosen to join us and um, if you're here in person or if you're um, watching us via Facebook, our live stream, or a little bit later onto YouTube, wherever you are, may God's warmth, love, and compassion touch your hearts as we worship together this morning. Um, so again, welcome to Calvary. Uh, just a couple announcements before we begin. Um, we next week we will be working our way into february and as is our custom our church council will be held uh next sunday immediately following the service um, as again as we've adopted many things um, because of the pandemic and out of uh, protocols um, we will of course be having a live in-person church council this uh, year we are also offering a zoom option and I'm anticipating that the Zoom will start around 11.30. So in your bulletin, if you choose to Zoom with us, um, you can see the link um, for Church Council Zoom there. And how we're gonna try to do things is have a shortened service, and so a shortened sermon. Uh, okay, that <laughs> got some reaction. Um, and a love feast. So those are, are probably all good things, I think except for the sermon. But uh, we'll be uh, together for a, a little bit of a shorter service, transitioning into a love feast and then right into church council and having church council here in the sanctuary as opposed to going downstairs. And so again, some options, but a way to uh, be together and to receive comments and questions and conversation and dialogue um, around some matters that we'll be, be sharing around church council. So, um, Exciting, fresh, and hot off the press are our annual reports for last year, for 2021. My thanks to Kathleen uh, Jenkins for working so hard and getting these together and everyone um, being timely with their annual reports this year. So feel free to pick this up. Um, please bring it back to church council. We're trying not to make as many copies if we don't need to. And if you choose to be virtual, uh, if you got our congregational email last week, you'll see that the PDF of this entire booklet was sent to you by email. So if you can use that option and you, you can do that, that's great. If not, uh, feel free to, to pick up a paper copy. And um, those are right in the back uh, after the church service. We, of course, as we are preparing for a love feast, we will have sugar cake and uh, sugar cakes to sell as well. We're still accepting orders and that is in the back. They'll be baking um, on Friday morning. So you can talk to Jerry or Blair if you're interested in helping out um, with sugar cake making. Uh, just to note, we, we got a, a little bit of a late notice of a, um, an exciting mid epiphany series that's being offered by a group of Moravians from different places. Um, it's on Zoom and it's starting next Wednesday, the 2nd and also the 9th. Um, and kind of an intriguing um, way to think about mid epiphany and uh, Groundhog's Day as well. So uh, you can look for that information um, on the back of your bulletin. And I think those are my announcements. Does anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Okay, all right. Well, as we, we come together, um, I'm going to share a bit from, as our call to worship, from again, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. But as we're spending a few weeks looking over from chapters 12 onward and um, engaging his conversations and dialogue with the people of Corinth, I wanted to move us back um, to really center us around the focus of this idea of, of love as a groundwork um, today. And what he says about love a few chapters earlier in chapter eight, I wanted to use as our call to worship today. So he, he's talking to the Corinthians about um, their question of whether or not they should be allowed to eat um, the food that is offered to idols. And um, there's some conversation around maybe what you might call the know-it-alls um, who are maybe expressing their knowledge without this, again, this groundwork of love. And here's what he's, he's saying to them. He says, now concerning food sacrificed to the idols, we know that all of us possesses knowledge. Then he says, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. 
So again, how are we allowing love to be that groundwork of our lives to um, not puff us up, but build up ourselves and our communities around us? Um, and as I was thinking about this, I thought a perfect intro to lead us into this conversation um, was one of our, our uh, wonderful songs that um, our member Rich Perone has written that we've used several times before, uh, entitled Carry Your Love. So we'll pause as we listen, enjoy um, Carry Your Love and shared by Rich Perone. Everything else in this world should change I know there's one thing that will always stay the same I will carry your love carry Sometimes it feels like I've been left on my own I know I'll never have to face this world all alone I will carry your love Carry your love All of my days I will carry your love Carry your love All of my days All of my days I will carry your love Again, my thanks to Rich. Um, as we're asked maybe how do we carry God's love into our world, um, our liturgy for adoration, for love, um, will be how we will begin our worship time together. So if you turn with me to page 18 in your hymnals, um, and let's stand as we pray together our liturgy for adoration. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let it rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising to the setting of the sun, the name of the Lord be praised. Glory be to you, Lord God, our Father. You are the merciful Father, the God from whom all help comes. You chose us in Jesus Christ, our Lord, before the creation of the world. 
He rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of your dear Son. In our union with Christ, you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. You have made us worthy to share in that which you have reserved for your people in the kingdom of light. Your love is so great that we may be called the children of God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we join in proclaiming the glory of your name. May be seated. <clears throat> Praise, honor, and glory be to you, Christ Jesus, Son of the living God. To you be glory at all times, in the church which waits on earth for you, and in that which is with you in heaven, now and forever. Jesus, you are the eternal word, who became a human being and lived among us. Those who were yours saw your glory, the glory which you received as the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. In you, the full content of the divine nature dwells in a human body. You are the true God and eternal life. Through you, the whole universe is reconciled to God. You made peace through your death on a cross. Therefore, God raised you to the highest place above and gave you the name which is greater than any other name. Glory be to you, Holy Spirit, our teacher, guide, and comforter. We proclaim your righteousness and praise. You pour out the love of God into the hearts of all believers and make their bodies your holy temples. By our own reason and strength, we cannot believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to him, but you call us through the gospel and enlighten us with gifts of grace. You dedicate us to God in the true faith, and you enable us to remain in union with Jesus Christ. We praise you together with the Father and Son, now and forever. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will 
and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord says, I, even I, am the God who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sin. Go and sin no more. Let us stand. Lord, make us truly one in spirit with all your faithful people as we profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom shall have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We'll pause here in our liturgies before we continue to pray um, in some corporate prayers for our, our world and the society around us to ask if there are prayers that you have to share, um, prayers of thanksgiving um, that you can offer thanks to God or prayers of concern for yourself or others uh, for the world around us. So um, are there prayers that work? Sam. Can I have a prayer that the situation in the Ukraine doesn't explode into World War III? Yes. So continue to watch what is happening between Ukraine and Russia and other powers and pray for peace in that region and uh, reconciliation among a very tense time there. So. Can I say a prayer of thanksgiving that both Spagnolas are, are in church today as well after? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Good to have you back. Any others? Um, 
We got a request for the prayer changes the other day um, from Jean Cutruff, um, prayers for her sister Lorraine, um, who was being um, treated for cancer a little while ago. Um, there is some need for more chemo treatments at this point, so she asked if you could keep Lorraine in your um, prayers as she goes back for more chemo treatments at this time. Um, also a prayer of Thanksgiving. Um, many of you heard that Charles Jenkins was in the hospital, um, received a procedure and is now home um, and I talked to him yesterday and uh, just continue to keep him in prayers for healing and recovery. Uh, maybe Kathleen as well as he's healing and recovering. So um, pray for them. And um, Alyssa Waldron was in for surgery on Friday and I did not get a chance to actually talk to her. I was texting, trying to text her. So I'm, I'm hoping she's doing okay. Um, continue to keep her in prayers. Um, we asked for prayers last week for her. So um, any other prayers? Okay. We turn back and before we turn back to page 24, as we um, come back into a time of, of corporate prayer together, let's just pause for a moment of silent prayer and maybe uh, offer those thoughts, those petitions to God that have been in your hearts um, this week to, to pray. As we know, our God hears prayers and even sighs that are sometimes too deep for words. May God continue to hear our prayers and be with us. Amen. We join on page 24 as we continue in prayer. Almighty God, for the opportunity to be used by you in the life of your church, for our use of your splendid gifts, for the joy of obedient service, we dedicate ourselves to you. For our creation and preservation and for all the blessings of this life, for your immeasurable love and the redemption of our world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the fellowship and ministry of your body, the church, for the opportunity of service in Christ's name through the power of the Holy Spirit, for your personal presence among us to guide and bless. We offer our thanks, dear Lord. For our congregation, that we may know and do your will. For our bishops, ministers, teachers, and leaders, that they may guide your people in the truth. For the peace of the world, and for the renewal of your whole church by the power of the Holy Spirit. For all who, in your name, work for justice, reconciliation, and peace. Lord, hear our prayer. For our community, for the whole land, and all who live in it, for the fruitfulness of the earth, and for the careful stewardship of our natural resources. For those who travel, for the poor, the homeless, and the imprisoned, for the afflicted, the persecuted, the abused, and those who face temptation, anger, or violence. For the sick and dying, and for the salvation of all. Lord, hear our prayer. Be gracious to us, for to you alone are due all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Please stand.
Amen. You may be seated. And each week we pause to acknowledge the gifts that we offer um, and their gifts of financial blessings that we can offer for the ministry of this church. And this Sunday as well, I want to offer a special thanks and a, a word of, of appreciation for all the gifts that have been offered just in the back of the sanctuary to the weather alert uh, boxes. And if you have a chance, you can take a look. We are almost out of room back there, which is awesome. So there's going to be a lot of great um, ready-to-eat packaging, uh, packaged foods that the Lehigh Conference of Churches will give uh, clients of the soup kitchen, as well as folks who are living in homeless camps um, in the area, especially when the soup kitchen uh, can't be operating like yesterday or um, on a snow day. So these are our great idea of the conference and thank you for your, um, your contributions. All the joyful noise for the month of January will also go to uh, fund more of those weather alert boxes. So uh, my appreciation. Um, and again, as appreciation, we welcome Bob to, to share our offerings as uh, we bring them forward. I'm excited today to have uh, Jaden Laudenslater read our scripture reading. And just before she begins, um, I wanted to just introduce this passage uh, by uh, considering the very uh, previous verse that we're not going to hear read in 1 thir uh, Corinthians 13, but the verse um, from 1 Corinthians 12:26 that Paul, after writing, and we've been talking about this for two weeks, um, about the, the gifts that the community of Corinth has, about how each of them are called to work as members of a body uh, for the greater good, for the common good. And then he says, at the very end of all that, he says, but strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. And so we ask, well, what is the more excellent way? And that's when we're gonna hear um, from Jaden um, about uh, the chapter 13 and what Paul will show us as the still more excellent way. So, Jaden. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. 
It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I respond like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part that I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jaden, for sharing that with us. So when John Lennon wrote, all you need is love, now you're going to sing that to yourselves that I said those words, when he wrote that song in 1967, um, Someone wrote about that song that he was trying to answer the call for a song that could be understood by people of all nations. Um, supposedly, Lenin was fascinated by the use of slogans and how slogans could affect masses. And he was trying to figure out a way that you could take a positive spin on <clears throat> the use of slogans um, to answer the question of his generation, um, the myths of what's happening in the mid-60s of turmoil and divisiveness, of what do we need um, with this slogan, all you need is love. <clears throat> and if you forget, and I didn't, I didn't add these up, I got this online, but love is mentioned 102 times uh, in that song. So you could, if you're bored today, you can make sure I'm right. Uh, so nearly 2,000 years earlier, <clears throat> it seems like the Apostle Paul um, is trying to say and ask what happens when we don't have love, um, and suggesting that maybe at the groundwork, this still more excellent gift, as I said, uh, that verse 26 in the last chapter, chapter 12, um, what we, we really need, all we really need is love. and. Maybe to the shock, maybe to the surprise of his audience in Corinth. So as I know, as you know, over the last two weeks, we've been spending some time and we'll continue on with chapter 15 for the next couple of weeks. Um, we've been spending some time looking at Paul's first letter to the Corinthian community in Greece. Um, and he is answering, as we've noted, some issues, some causes for division, some, as I, as I said in our call to worship, some puffed up people, you could call them, um, that, that think their way, their gifts, their member is maybe better uh, or a higher status um, than another. Um, he's talking to us in chapter 12 about how each of us has a gift that is given, not because of what we did, but because of what the Spirit is giving us, and how each of us, like the members of the body, is called to use all those gifts to work together, and in fact, they're needed to work together uh, for the building up of the common good. And yet now, it seems like there's a problem in that early community um, that Paul has established. It seems like, in, as in chapter 8, they're being puffed up. Um, they're, they're filled up with this divisiveness of maybe thinking that their sharing of their gift is the best way, or they're rejoicing because they're able to do something that someone else isn't able to do. Um, and I think that Paul is trying to say here is, are you sharing each of these gifts, being a member of the body with this groundwork, with this far more excellent way uh, of love? Um, so I was th trying to think about this, of what it means to have the groundwork of love, to uh, approach a situation, a scenario, with this foundation of love. And I, I thought about two different scenarios of a, of a common experience that probably we've all had, um, or, or we will have at some point. 
So here's a scenario I was, two, two scenarios I was thinking about, about a visit to a doctor. So the doctor, you get into the doctor's office and the doctor's office walls are filled with her credentials, her achievements. Um, she speaks to you and really knows what she's talking about. And you know that. Um, there's a clear diagnosis on, uh, based on the right tests that are being done and, and a clear route to treatment. Of all that, and yet the tone, the tone is methodical. Um, there's no engagement with you, uh, looking down at notes. There's, there's no empathy. There's no question that she asked of you about what's the best course for you or how you're feeling about this or how you feel. Um, the tone and the manners uh, don't convey any kind of love or compassion or concern. It could have just very well been a robot that was diagnosing you or a human. Scenario one. In scenario two, you have a doctor with all the same credentials and all the same great stuff hanging on his wall and the same way of diagnosing you, and yet this time he listens for a little bit. He asks questions. He has this tone, and it's hard to really qualify, quantify this, but a way of, of um, showing empathy and compassion and love. And you have these two scenarios that on face value would lead you to the same exact route, but think about the difference that it makes for you um, when the grounding of someone's approach is love, uh, when their framework, when their far more excellent way, when the way that they do everything is based out of a way of love. Everything the same on the outside, but we know that something is so different and so fundamentally important about that grounding of love. And I'm wondering if, if that's what Paul is experiencing in Corinth. That the Corinthians might have been doing all the right things. Um, they were sharing, they were developing their gifts, their skills. Um, they were welcoming each other with different, uh, like the different parts of the body. But when they were doing that, they were boasting about it. Uh, they weren't showing kindness. They were a little impatient with how um, they were impatient with how the other member wasn't cooperating the same way. Maybe they were rude. All of that to say is that their grounding, their, their foundation was not out of love. And is that why at the end of this long chapter in chapter 12, Paul decides to go into chapter 13 and write about this far more excellent way of love. So it's safe to say that if you nodded with familiarity at hearing this passage, it's probably because you've heard it at a wedding before. And um, I'm sure if you, well, if you're like me and you've been to a lot of weddings or if you've been to occasional weddings, it may have been read, a um, very popular passage to read at weddings. Some pastors kind of get a little, a little snooty about this and say, ah, no, this is not for that at all. But while Paul isn't writing to a couple being married, um, it certainly could be understood in the context of a relationship that two couples are engaging in. Um, but rather than letting this passage, of course, get pigeonholed into um, about wedding scripts, we, we of course know when we read chapter 12 before it that it's about much, much more. Um, it's about love, of course, being the groundwork to all relationships, to all manners of living. And love being that groundwork because it's a way of setting us free from the divisiveness, from the competition that seems to be plaguing this early church in Corinth. So if this love is a way of living then, it moves love from that romantic feeling or those friendly emotions that maybe we might associate with a, a wedding day. Um, it moves it from those, those feelings of love I think to an action of love. And some have actually suggested that maybe we should reread this passage and change um, some of those words that imply that love is a feeling that says love is patient or love is kind um, to kind of an action uh, pointing us to how we are to act with love. Love shows patience. Love acts with kindness, practices kindness. Um, so kind of moving that into a into an action. But time to kind of reevaluate again. If we've moved ourselves again from this feeling of love into an action of love, 
um, we still have to kind of check ourselves because is the action of love that we're doing wrapped up in those kind of easy acts of love? Maybe smiling at a neighbor, um, patiently waiting your turn in traffic, which can be difficult, but still can be practiced. Um, those are all good, but writing about love as a verb can kind of remind us that love truly practiced can force us to do some difficult things. Um, and if we are to take our Moravian motto seriously, and, and um, as good Moravians we know that in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty, and then we say it, let's say it together, and in all things love, um, if we take that part of the what we call the Moravian motto, that we should do all things in love, doing some of those things in love that, that come across our daily days um, are sometimes kind of difficult to act in love. Maybe it's making a difficult stand to stand up for something that's right. Maybe it's saying um, necessary words that sometimes are difficult to share. Um, maybe it's speaking out when it's not necessarily a popular thing to do or safe. Uh, Frederick Buchner, the author and um, theologian, writes that loving is not liking. That our call, again, in the greatest commandment, our call from Paul here about in all things love, that we're called to love, but not necessarily maybe to like our neighbors. And I know that's, that might be a little puzzling to hear at first. But he writes that oh, if we are only liking another, um, sometimes it makes us unwilling to be honest with what is truly needed for their um, well-being. He says that loving others is what can make us honest. And he uses a rather difficult example when he writes about love. Um, he says, you know, when Jesus talked to the Pharisees, he didn't say to them when they were being, um, they were, they were being dogmatic and, and challenging God's expansive love, he didn't say to them when they were um, looking at, uh, with disgust at the lepers and not allowing healing uh, of those who needed it. He didn't say to the Pharisees, he didn't say, you know, they're there, everything's gonna be okay. Jesus instead said some pretty harsh words and we read about those and if we remember our Holy Week readings, he says, you know, to the Pharisees, you brood of vipers. How do you speak good when you do evil? But Buchner contends that he says these difficult words that they have to hear because he loves them. Not likes them, but he loves them. Oh, challenging part of love. But finally, at the end of the passage, as Paul says, he's reminding us that love never ends. And when I hear those words, I can't help but connect that to the statement that Moses um, experienced as he encounters God in the burning bush, um, that God, who God is, that God was and God is and God will be, of this eternity of love, of love was, love is, and love will be. And if this is our essential faith statement, it means when we're called to love God, as we know is the greatest commandment, we're called to pay attention to where God is and to what God loves. So we're called to pay attention to where God is and to what God loves. So where is love in our lives? Um, love, and when the next time you hear this passage at a wedding service, don't take that away from that couple. Love is there in that moment when these words are read between two people deeply committed to each other. But love can also be found, like I said, in an act of difficult honesty, of saying words that need to be spoken, standing up to a bully, making a statement for justice. Love can be found, as Jesus' ministry shows over and over, in acts of reaching out to the unloved, to the leper of his day, and whoever the leper of our days are, the most unloved of his society, searching for the lost sheep, the lost coin. Love never ends. So where is God? Where is love? Love seems to be expansive. Um, another familiar passage that we see, aside from 1 Corinthians, if you would probably list people's familiar passages, one that we often see on billboards and baseball games is John uh, 3.16. 
God so loved the world that he gave his son. So again, asking that question, if love never ends, where is love? Uh, where is God? And God is saying here that God so loved the whole world. Not one people, not one tribe, uh, not one place, but the whole world. And again, if we want to follow God in love, maybe again this passage stretches our expanse, our, our minds and our boundaries and our borders um, to include more of this whole world. So I'm not saying this for any particular reason, but we do have 14 days until Valentine's Day. Um, just a heads up to anybody here needs to write that on their calendar. Um, and of course, Valentine's Day, it would have been perfect if the lectionary had moved this back to uh, two weeks from now. But of course, we speak about love um, on Valentine's Day, that day constructed by our, our society, but of course dating back to St. Valentine, but a day that often now has turned into uh, teaching us about love as a feeling, that it's a, a romantic feeling maybe, or a feeling of, of love between uh, two friends. Again, um, this passage might challenge that notion of Valentine's Day and expand it, hopefully, for us. Um, and I loved the definition of love from 1 Corinthians, from this chapter that's, um, that was written about by a theologian, uh, Christer Stendel, New Testament theologian. He writes these words about what true love really can be. He says, true love is not measured by how good it makes us feel. In the context of this chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, it's better to say that the measure of love is its capacity for tension and disagreement without division. Its capacity for tension and disagreement without division. It's important here. He is acknowledging that in our world, there is always going to be tension and disagreement, right? Uh, no denial about that. There's always going to be in our society people who like Hawaiian pizza, and people who think it's disgusting to put pineapple on pizza, right? We're never going to settle that. Okay. There's always going to be, uh, and I think this is true if you study democracies, there's always going to be different views of the role of government in society. There's always probably going to be many different beliefs about God or not about God at all. Um, there's going to be people that are coming from a variety of family backgrounds and cultures, and there's going to be tension and disagreement. Uh, that will be here today, and that will be here tomorrow. But the question, as Stendhal points out, the question is, what is the role of love? The role of love as a foundation is what prevents division. Not tension and disagreements, but division, dividing ourselves over those. And that's what the Apostle Paul writes here, is that still more excellent way, the way of love to a very divisive community of Corinth. So he knows there's always going to be disagreement, I think, but he knows that we can disagree in two really different ways. We can disagree with boasting and rudeness um, and impatiently and breaking everything down and not caring about the foundation of the person. Or we can disagree with acknowledging that you are a child of God, with love as our framework. Um, and so I hear Paul saying in this passage, choose love, practice that love. It's not going to be easy, but try it, practice it. Practice loving the person that you are disagreeing with. Um, practice seeing them as a child of God. Hope for reconciliation. Don't give up your viewpoint. Keep working for that. But don't allow hate to take over, boasting or rudeness or impatience or divisions. So maybe, again, this passage is especially important today. There's no denying that, um, and some people have written, that we're maybe more divided today than we were since the Civil War as, as a country. Um, it's hard to know, but um, that definitely seems to be um, some theories. And again, our hope lies not in saying that we're going to find a magical time when we're all going to agree or get rid of all tension, but to ask if we can practice this love to not be so divided, um, that we can work out of a framework, a grounding of love, uh, to not be so divided. 
If I'm grounded in love, if I, as Moravians, we say, if we do all things in love, um, if I believe that love never ends, then ask ourselves in just everything we do, are we working out of a grounding of love? So may we be blessed and hopefully loved as we continue to carry out that practice. Um, our last hymn, and I just want to share that, that one verse before we sing it, um, is hymn 590, and you'll probably be uh, familiar with this, but again, that last verse, let me just share that as we conclude this message um, from our, our next, last hymn. Come, Holy, come, Spirit, come, our hearts control, our spirits long to be made whole. Let inward love guide every deed. By this we worship and are freed. Amen. So let's stand um, as we sing 590. Now again, go out blessed and surrounded and empowered by God's love, knowing that faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Amen.